Yeah. All right, folks. Oh, we have some folks who, okay, good. So if you are not muted, please do mute because um, we do get some feedback. We are so excited to have you here today. Um, for the anatomy of a renovation. Um, we are probably going to have some more people sort of filter in and join us. Um, and uh, that will be great. But there are also already some people who have asked for the recording. So I know there's a lot of interest in this. Um, if you have any sort of tech questions or other questions, please put those in the chat. While Mike is presenting, I'll keep an eye on the chat. So Mike, if any questions come up for you, um, whenever there's sort of a natural stopping point, I will um, let you know what people have been asking. But with that, I will turn it over to you and we will get started. Okay, great. Thanks, Jenny. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Uh, and I'm going to turn off the camera just because we don't really need it. Uh, but I want you to know I was really there. Uh, this is a presentation that I did last month uh, down in Miami, and uh, the, uh, this is the conference logo, uh, and that's the International Association of University Libraries, and I wanted to share this with you because I put this together in, in some ways for my own benefit, because just to get this all in my mind straight as we're entering the, our renovation project, but also to kind of share that in being in an international conference, you're kind of sharing with an international audience, uh, kind of how we do things over here. Uh, this was, and I, I'm gonna use the original slides. So that's why it's got the June 14th date on there. The what's different is the, the, the verbiage, uh, what I talk about, cause I am gonna kind of try to talk about it more in terms of what it uh, means to us. Uh, but I think it's a good way to, for you guys to see where we're headed with the renovation project. Uh, sometimes it's going to seem slow and then sometimes it'll go fast, but all these different steps are an important part of it. Uh, I did share this with our um, a designer. Uh, the lead designer is uh, Chris Roberts with LS3P. Uh, so he's seen it and liked it. I shared it with our project managers, uh, Buddy Hell and uh, Delena over in uh, FDC. So uh, I'm, I'm telling you that because they kind of validated that uh, I had all the steps right and things like that. Uh, and then some of the stuff when we get to the end where there's some of the graphics and, and photographs of stuff and things, you've seen that already, but I'll just kind of uh, share how I explain that in the presentation. Um, the important thing to me is that uh, we're not the only ones that's done a done a renovation have done a reservation or will be doing a renovation. Uh, LS3P is actually doing a uh, expansion at UNCW and um, they're not doing as much renovation as they are expanding, uh, adding, uh, adding to the building. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually common practice. And the, uh, you guys all know about Hop Library over in um, uh, 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 NC State and uh, various pro other projects around the state. So it's our turn. And, uh, and so that's why I think um, we wanna make sure we embrace it, we're excited about it and, and that kind of stuff. So the only slide that I added to this deck and this is already in my NC Docs page, as long as well as the paper that goes along with it. Uh, the only slide I added was this one, just to show you I really was there. So that's me presenting it uh, at the conference. It was at the University of Miami, uh, in Miami, and very beautiful campus. Um, I grew up in Florida, so it was really neat to go back there. But um, they have a beautiful campus, beautiful library, and uh, it's just uh, hot and crowded. So if you like hot and crowded, that's a good place to be. So to get started, uh, the theme of the conference was weaving our future. So I wanted to make sure I kind of got that into the presentation. And um, what I basically am going to do is I'm going to break down the renovation process and all the different steps that's going to be part of this. And it's, it's the same steps that we're going to see over the next um, uh, five years. And, um, and then the case study is kind of talking about what we're expecting to do here. And then I did have to do a little commercial at the end for the Journal of Learning Spaces, uh, which is in its 11th year and has just done an outstanding job of, uh, I think, uh, raising the, the scholarly profile of learning spaces um, uh, internationally. We have a lot of international participation in that as well. So I just wanted to do a little commercial for it. And um, I did talk about this publication a little bit. This is something new, new in the sense of the last, it was, came out about three or four months ago. 
is a publication from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, so um, that's the other thing that I think a lot of us have been doing that's going to be involved in the project is looking at kind of what's happening out there in academic libraries and getting um, a feel for uh, emerging trends, uh, uh, perceptions of libraries on the campus, uh, where we're headed with all of this. So that's a good publication. Um, right now, our copy is with Steve Morley who is the director of space planning and utilization on campus. And when he gets it back, uh, I'll make sure it's available somewhere for anyone who wants to look at it. Excuse me. So I start in talking about why do you need a renovation? And a lot of people will say, well, you need a renovation if your building's old and stuff like that. But it's more than that. It's more than just the age of a building. Uh, obviously wear and tear on a building makes a big difference. But just if the look is outdated, that becomes a turnoff to your stakeholders, whether it's uh, students, faculty, or staff. Uh, the te technology uh, gets outdated and the accessibility of the technology gets outdated. Uh, over the years, there's changes to the pedagogies that's being used or uh, called upon within the building. Uh, safety standards become a problem and that's our situation. So in our situation, yes, the building's outdated. When we were doing the master space plan, there was a lot of references to brutalist architecture. And that, I don't hear that as much anymore as I do the, uh, the safety issues. Um, changes to the mission and the campus needs. Uh, there's a strong desire that this renovation library, renovated library that we're building uh, is gonna be a learning hub on campus since we are centrally located on campus. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of changes to the user expectations for what the space is gonna be for them. Um, and, uh, and there's a, a lot of components to that. Uh, students use the building um, a lot differently than they used to. And especially uh, Jackson, the main building when it opened in 1950, if you look at some of those photographs, you, get, you, you, you don't see anything that you see today. Uh, card catalogs are gone. Um, uh, uh, seating was actually um, um, uncomfortable uh, back then and stuff like that. I, I think we finally got rid of the last wooden chairs that were from the 1950s uh, just a few years ago. Um, I remember thinking, hey, the wooden chairs are gone. Um, but I laid this out for the group uh, in these steps. So this is all the steps that we are going to go through with this renovation. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, all these different pieces individually, but they all, they all have a place and they all have a, a meaning in terms of how this is going to play out for us and any other renovation that you um, might run into in the future. So let's start with funding. Now, you guys have been hearing us talk about the fact that we've got the $81 million from, from, the, from the state budget. Um, so your government support is, is obviously critical. But one thing to keep in mind is that that's usually targeted into particular areas. So for us, that $81 million is going to be targeted into um, the infrastructure as a capital improvement. And, and you guys all know, you know, we need uh, updates to HVAC, uh, plumbing, uh, fire alarm systems, uh, data ports, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> ADA compliance is a big issue that you guys know and we've been talking about. Uh, so your government funding is typically going to focus on that. And with, in our case, it's the state and other situations that might be a county or a federal uh, type of funding, but it, it still kind of is, is government oriented. Uh, there's also donor support coming uh, through campaigns or through just whatever kind of development activity that uh, is going on out there. So you're going to hear more about that. We actually had an AAG retreat yesterday and we talked about that some. Uh, we know already that uh, our, our, our government support is not going to cover uh, FFE, which is uh, fixtures, furniture, and equipment. So uh, as we move forward and things start developing, one thing that we'll start doing is more active fundraising uh, for FFE so that we uh, have some money to spend for that when the time comes, which is going to be uh, four to five years down the road. And then sometimes you have grassroots advocacy that's trying to support the library. This happens more in public libraries, but that's where a group get together and try to do some kind of larger fundraising effort in order to marshal enough funds to make a difference. Uh, 
But you, you've got to start, you know, once you've determined what the need is and why a renovation is needed, which is going to help, help justify the reasons that you should be funded or supported uh, by these uh, uh, types, funding types. The price of space has is, is been uh, going up, but it does cost money. And that's something that's not always uh, considered. Uh, just maintaining print collections year after year um, uh, costs money, it's an ongoing cost. Uh, and and as, you, as you turn your materials, there's processing, there's the access delivery cost, uh, shelving, repairing as needed. Uh, some universities go and uh, develop a storage or retrieval uh, options. Uh, from a remote storage. The storage that we have over in Ferguson does cost us some money, maybe not much, but depending on how often something's retrieved, that means we're paying somebody to go get it and, and or some uh, equipment or support to, to get it like a golf cart. Uh, new technologies cost money as you put them into the spaces. And if you think about it, you know, when, when Jackson was opened in 1950 uh, and the tower in the mid seventies, there were no computers. So all of that stuff has been added later. Uh, you know, little projects, we've added uh, data ports and, and things like that to support the technology, but that does become a, a, a cost that's associated with the space. Uh, infrastructure needs, um, I don't know if you guys remember over the years, different things has happened. Uh, we've had to replace uh, transformers, um, uh, air conditioning units, uh, plumbing uh, uh, issues. So there's the, the ongoing maintenance of the building is important. And then of course, updating furnishings, which we've been trying to do uh, the last few years uh, in anticipation of this. So uh, funding is limited. You know, it's always going to be limited. I don't think anyone's ever going to say, here, take what you need and give us back what's left. Uh, so you have to kind of think of it in terms of making uh, the good choices as you go forward. So the next piece of this is recognizing what's happening out in the environment. OK, so uh, calling it an environmental scan. So uh, there's a lot of things to consider, like, for example, on campus. There's, um, uh, there's changes to what happens to other spaces on campus. Uh, if you guys remember when the quad was built, uh, they put into those quads common rooms, which technically married, mirrored some of the study rooms that we might have had um, or might have. And, and so uh, you want to know what else is going on out there, uh, especially in a case like ours where we're connected to the student union and we're between the student union and the dining hall and what they do with their space could impact what we end up doing to our space. So knowing what's happening um, on campus is important. Knowing what's going on in the immediate area uh, from a business perspective is important. Um, there's trends out there now of um, uh, companies that buy old warehouses and refurbish them and then rent them out as office spaces. Uh, some, some temporarily, some long-term, but uh, the point is it, it, it could be a form of competition. Uh, we have an Apple store over near Friendly, and uh, what's important about that and from an environmental scan point of view is we might have the same student as they have an Apple customer, and they're going into that store and kind of service, getting service at the Genius Bar, and they bring that perception into the library. Uh, same with a bookstore like Barnes & Noble. I mean, I think you guys know I used to manage a Barnes & Noble, and what was funny to me is that there would be behaviors that Barnes & Noble customers would have that I didn't understand until I worked in the libraries. And then I recognized that those behaviors came from uh, library users who were then going into a bookstore and, uh, <clears throat> for example, putting the books that they were going to buy in a backpack and then putting the backpack up on the counter to check out. And I'm like, because you don't do that in retail, that's concealment. Uh, but they were used to doing that in the library, putting their library books in the backpack to go check out. So it was kind of interesting from that point of view. And I have to talk about virtual competition because since we've been through what we've been through in the last few years, uh, that virtual competition is important. Um, used to, or the way it evolved, is a reference desk type of activity changed when students would like go to Google first which means when they come to the reference desk, they've already Googled it and found some information. So the, uh, the, the, the type of question is gonna be different. It's not gonna be the basic, how to get started. It's gonna be, I'm already this, way, this far into it. I mean, that's just one form of it. 
what's happening is a lot of, um, since then, there's a lot of other uh, private companies that's developed various uh, reference strategies or resource uh, strategies that you can either pay and, and not some not always, uh, but that does become part of what you want to look at in an environmental scan. What other uh, options do your users have? Um, so some of the other considerations about an environment is going to be um, looking at your space in terms of what's going to be needed with study and learning, what's going to be needed in terms of comfort and in, inviting, you know, and, and welcoming people in. Uh, we still have people wanting quiet space, so uh, the library is still seen as, as uh, needing a space for individual uh, compu compilation or community space for that group study uh, activity and collaborative learning. And it'll be interesting to see going into this next semester uh, how that uh, comes back together in terms of people studying together. Uh, the space needs to serve as a gateway and, and an accessibility for anyone to be able to study and learn and research and have all the, the related resources connected to it. And if you're familiar with the concept of third place space, and um, I hope you guys are, it, that term kind of came up in the mid 90s, I believe. Um, but it's a place, it was defined as a place that you go to when you're not at work or not at home. You know, where do you go to um, have some community involvement, uh, interaction, uh, uh, think, you know, be creative, that kind of stuff. Um, so the libraries, um, in, in addition to bookstores, coffee shops, things like that, have been a strong third place uh, type of space. So that's also something to be considered. This came from the book, uh, The Great uh, Good Place. So this is where um, <clears throat> Ogleberg, uh, Aldenberg uh, introduced that concept in here. These are some of the characteristics of that space and what that was meant to be for. But it was meant to be kind of a, a space that uh, was um, uh, neutral in, in nature and level the playing field for folks, uh, had all the components of accessibility and accommodation, but allowed you to be uh, creative and, and had a, have a playful mood. But it's, it's your home away from home. And so, and as you put together a library, that's one thing to think about because people see it that way. So the next thing is approval. And, and the reason this becomes an important step is because we're going through that right now. Okay, uh, so um, we had the, the master space plan. Uh, and I, I said this at all personnel meeting, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it here just uh, for, uh, to, to pull it together. Uh, the master space plan was really driving a number so that we could see what was needed, um, dig a, a, not a deep hole, but dig into it enough to know all the nuances that was gonna be part of this, come up with a number to present to the chancellor to say, hey, this is what we need to renovate and expand this library. And, and it worked, he bought it, he approved it, he made it our number one capital priority for this campus. Uh, so that's, that's a form of approval. And then that went to the state legislature. And that's where, you know, it was sitting there when the pandemic started and, and what, what happened was the budget got uh, uh, postponed or paused. It was taken out of the request until this was over. Uh, but then it got put back in and, and then we, we, we got our, our consideration. We didn't get as much as we need, okay? But we got a, a substantial amount. And so um, the, that's, that's the approval part there. So in this case, it was being approved on campus by the chancellor and then off to the legislature to be approved by that. Uh, I do wanna shout out to Mitchell uh, Stetzer, who is a, a representative from Catawba County. And I've learned that he's an alumni and he was a strong advocate for us getting this much money for our renovation. So I've sent him a little goodie bag of swag and a thank you note for that. Um, the other thing that has to happen is you've got a variety of level of construction authorities. Uh, in this case, it's, it's usually the Office of State Construction, and they're looking at a wide range of things, all the code uh, issues, the policy issues, safety issues. Uh, I remember when we were doing a mini renovation, I found out that because the buildings are joined, uh, it's considered one building. And what's, what's, what's interesting or, or, or important about this is back, uh, if you guys remember the movie, The Towering Inferno, 
Uh, that movie created states to go back and look at high rises uh, more carefully. So it changed a lot of codes uh, for buildings that were over four uh, levels high. And uh, so in our case, that also changed the code for the main building. And I think that came to play in particular when we were renovating the third floor closed stack area for uh, special collections. Because to do that, if you remember, if you were here then, you remember we, we had to remodel those uh, small staircases uh, to make them fireproof because now they are egress. And we added a men's room to that second floor lobby because there wasn't one and, and code had changed that you needed stuff like that. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that also goes through appro approval processes. Um, and then the uh, authoritative guidance is going to be any designer, any construction company, they are going to be following these same codes. So even if uh, we want something that's um, uh, specific or something like that, if it's not allowed in code, we're not going to get it. Um, so, th so those approvals are important to keep in mind uh, as we go forward. Uh, and, I, and breaking news, so I've mentioned that we uh, have our designer. Um, the Board of Trustees met today and they approved our selection for the construction manager at risk. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but see, that was a step that we've been waiting to happen. So now that that's happened, <clears throat> it's going to go and get signed off on and that kind of stuff. Uh, they'll have a contract written up and uh, that's another level of approval that was needed. But now that we've done that, that's, that's another step. And along the way, the next thing is going to be to start work looking at a kickoff meeting and getting started. So that's, um, that's what's next and that's, what, that's what's exciting. So um, the next step, and I, so I mentioned that kickoff meeting, the next step that's gonna happen is the whole programming piece of it. And this is where you guys are gonna get involved because the designer is going to put together a variety of methods um, uh, for programming. So technically what programming means is they're looking at the spaces to see what are you doing in the space or, or what are the stakeholders doing in the space? You know, how is it used? Does it need natural light? Does it need um, uh, uh, carpeting? That, you know, that kind of stuff. So they're looking at the services that's going to be in the different, uh, different spaces and the stakeholder needs. They're looking at general expectations, maybe in terms of technology or something like that. And then they start this whole information gathering process. And this is kind of an example of what that means. That means they're going to look primarily at uh, data that they can gather firsthand. Uh, that's on the left side that you know, can be experimental spaces. It can be like pilot projects just to see how it's gonna work out. It can be surveys, interviews, focus groups. It can be direct observation, or it can even be testing some environments just to see how people react to them. Uh, on the right side is secondary data, and this is where you're looking at reports, historical type data, uh, things from professional publications, things that have been benchmarked or best practiced. Uh, sometimes you can even purchase that data, data if, if needed to see what's happening in the profession. Uh, so all of this is part of what's going to be uh, gathered <clears throat> from an information perspective for that programming uh, piece of it. Um, there's an interesting book that is a little outdated now, but it's called Why We Shop, and it's about, um, it's about a company that actually uh, observed shopping behaviors and, uh, in detail, and I'm talking about if, if somebody picked up a, uh, a jar of perfume off a display and held it in their hand for 10 seconds and then set it down, I mean, that's the kind of stuff they were looking at. I don't think we'll get to that detailed, but the point is, you're observing how people use the space. And that makes a difference uh, in terms of decision-making going forward. Um, this is just an example of uh, some of the stats. This was from the master space plan. And it's, um, it's uh, uh, just some numbers on the different uh, uh, functional space uh, that's gonna feed up into other, other information as we get there. But that's an example of that uh, secondary data. Uh, this is an example of the uh, uh, primary data, meaning it's focus groups. Um, this is some focus group type of activity. So this is this is data that's being gathered by in, in present time. Okay, so this will be part of the designers' work 
uh, they might engage us in helping with some of it, uh, don't know yet. Uh, but this is where you're actually uh, using a, a variety of tools to get perspective from your stakeholders on what the, what the space need, means to them. Uh, we've done assessment studies in the past. Uh, this is just sharing from uh, something uh, we did back probably over 10 years ago uh, in terms of we did some focus groups, we did some observational studies, and we did some surveys. And the point was we were trying to determine uh, how the building was being used to make some uh, furniture purchasing decisions. And they're going to do the same type of thing, is, is have these different types of assessment uh, to, to answer certain questions and, and direct design and uh, request for funds a certain way. So that's one thing to, to look forward to. <clears throat> we also did site visits and um, uh, you might have heard me talk about that before. We did that in 2018. And so that informed the final publication of the master space plan in 2019. But we learned a lot. Uh, and this, the, the following slides are just a few examples. Um, over at um, D.H. Hill Library at State, which is the older library that since then they finished their renovations. Um, and so we need to make another trip over there just to see what they did. Uh, but this is some of the things we learned there. Um, they created a central service point. They uh, specifically put it adjacent to their maker studio uh, for a service point of view. Uh, they had a lot of creative furniture. I called it Alice in Wonderland furniture uh, because that was what their assessment kind of pointed to that people wanted to see. But they did, and, and I don't know if you guys know this about State, they published a book on chairs. So they actually published a little book on all the different types of chairs that they have. So they looked at a wide variety of chair types, uh, different styles and comfort. Um, so they had a little, they had something for everyone, so to say. And, and this is where the, there was a lot of conversation about the furniture being on wheels. So it can be mobile, it can be moved around, and it can become um, different things for different groups and different people. Uh, also at Hill, we saw, uh, this is where we first saw glass walls. Uh, they were called dirt walls, dirt being the uh, vendor name, but it helped uh, segregate different areas of the space. Uh, to reduce uh, sound, um, uh, you know, sound considerations for whatever activity was in there. Uh, but you're able to integrate electrical, technical in there, helps keep things clean um, that we noticed, uh, that it was very neat and clean and, and we're not an announced visit, we're just kind of coming in and observing. And so we were impressed with that. Um, and then we also talked in this in that particular place about the fact that um, you are under state contract when you buy furniture. A lot of you guys know that based on what we've done here. Uh, so it's important to, as you're looking through and making these choices that you're connecting that to um, what's available to purchase from a state point of view. Uh, over at Hunt Library, this is the engineering library that um, opened in, it's been about seven years ago, I think. And um, uh, so it's still the new kid on the block, so to say, until, uh, until we come to play, so to say. But we noticed there are a lot of whiteboards, and that's why I think you've seen us focus on buying more whiteboards as we go forward. Um, we got into a conversation with them about uh, Herman Miller because we saw a lot of that, and I can just tell you from looking at stuff that it's expensive. But um, uh, the folks giving us the tour made the case that by buying higher quality, more expensive stuff, it lasts longer, it's more durable. So I took that to heart when we were um, uh, outfitting the tower after the uh, uh, right sizing project. And I went to Agati, and uh, that's what a lot of that furniture on the north walls are on some of the furniture floors. And it is high quality. It's heavy, it's, it's solid, uh, and it has it, it's, it's held up. Uh, the, the, the stuff's been up there about four or five years now. So that'll be a consideration when we get to that point of uh, uh, what, you know, how much are we willing to spend? What kind of quality do we want? And you know, how long is it expected to, to last? Uh, we're seeing now a lot of stadium seating, and uh, this is a good example uh, in Hill Library. There's that uh, big stairway uh, through the middle. This is similar to the one over in the nursing building. Uh, if you have not been in the nursing building, it's worth taking a look, going over there and taking a look at this. 
because it opens up the building, a, a bright open space, the stairwell right through the middle of it is used for seating, it's used for presentations. Uh, I, I, I went over there when they did the ribbon cutting and, and just and sat on a step, you know, with a lot, a lot of other people watching the uh, ceremony. So that's a, that's a common feature now. Um, and then we saw some faculty spaces that uh, ha are, are have controlled access. So just faculty or GAs or someone like that uh, have access to them. And, and that's an important trend too. We've always wanted to have a uh, graduate uh, commons area. And so that's that's part of that kind of design is, is having a space that you can uh, have controlled access to and give, give it to who you need to like graduate students. Um, also at, at the Hunt Library, we looked at the chairs, the durability. Um, they've got a lot of technology. I know some of you have been over there. So um, uh, they've got gaming rooms. We saw at Georgia State what they call a, a curve, which is a um, uh, like a 25 foot screen that uh, does a lot of neat GIS presentations and things like that in there. Uh, it helps with accessibility. But they also made a point of talking in terms of how when you get things like that, people can be concerned about that. It's, oh, it's new technology. It's something new. I'm going to break it. I don't know how to use it, that kind of stuff. But uh, these days, things like that are, are much easier to manage. And so they, uh, they assured us and they demonstrated how easy it was to use uh, some of this higher level technology. I uh, had a conversation about the placement of floor plugs. And so in this case, they put in the floor plugs. And the point is that you're putting your furniture over the floor plugs so that it's not a tripping hazard. And you can see, I, I took that picture on purpose because uh, those guys had moved the tables away from the plug, which still created a tripping hazard. Uh, but that's just, that's poor execution and, uh, of, the, of the use of the space, not the construction, but just something to think about. Service concepts overall, we and, and uh, I should say we went to uh, we went to uh, NC State, two libraries there. We went up to Virginia, to Virginia Commonwealth. We went to Liberty, uh, which has a beautiful new library. Um, we went to Georgia, went to Georgia State and Georgia Tech. So uh, we saw a wide variety of things, and and overall we saw service concepts. Uh, uh, like this. Uh, this is a triage type model at both NC State and at uh, VCU. Uh, this is where you don't have a large counter, but you have you do have a place for uh, staff to be positioned. And then uh, as a uh, user walks up and, and has a need, then they can direct them to the right desk or department or area. Um, the um, hockey puck chargers comment, that's the first place I saw where they were uh, actually checking out uh, wireless um, hotspots and they called it a hockey puck. And um, uh, like I said, that was a few years ago and, and, and we, I've seen it a lot more now, but uh, that, that gave us the idea to, to be thinking about stuff like that. Uh, we had conversations about how security and housekeeping was centralized, uh, specifically over at Hunt Library the lady giving us the tour, I knew from NCLA and I, and I said, you know, just tell me something. Every time I go in here, all these chairs are pushed in nice and neat and there's no trash on the floor and this that, and the other. I said, do you have housekeeping all the time? And she said, no, they have centralized housekeeping that comes in in the beginning, at the beginning of the day, but then they hire people to um, uh, keep the building straightened up during the day because they have so much traffic. And, uh, and I thought that was very nice, but <clears throat> it's, it's something that's not always sustainable when you're moving into budget situations. Um, and then uh, a lot of this is back to the exterior updates that help modernize uh, what you're looking at. So that's important, I think, to look at that at this stage so that you know, you, <clears throat> if your infrastructure is updated, you wanna make sure people know it and that you are in a more of a modern setting now than you were. Uh, this is some a couple of shots from Virginia Commonwealth. Uh, we uh, the reason I took the picture on the left is because it was presented as a steel case product that had never been shown to me as we were looking at options. So it what I what I learned from that <clears throat> was to push your vendor a little harder sometimes uh, to make sure that they're showing you everything uh, and not just what they think you want to see. Um, that's that's kind of what I was thinking there. 
Um, the walls on the right side, um, they regretted getting these because they're topless and the, uh, the noise uh, comes out of them. So that's another piece of assessment is to kind of find where certain furniture types are and then find out if they're, how useful they are and how, uh, how uh, user friendly they've been. Uh, this was also at BCU. Uh, this is a multifunctional space. This is the type of space that the chancellor has uh, been targeting for us to have. Uh, uh, the Cone Ballroom over at e, uh, uh, EUC is uh, student uh, funded. You know, the student union is, is purchased and renovated and maintained with student funds. And so we really need something on campus that's uh, done with state funds. So we looked at this particularly uh, because uh, we wanted a multifunctional event space similar to Cone. Uh, this has a catering kitchen adjacent to it, which that was actually the impetus for buying the um, uh, larger freezer, refrigerator, uh, ice maker down in the staff lounge is to, uh, to have that capability. Uh, it's just the timing wasn't good because of uh, the pandemic but it's got large screen projection features. It has an adjacent outdoor space that you can't see, but it, it brings that convening uh, element to the library. And uh, that's what the chancellor has been uh, asking for. At Liberty, um, once again, we saw different levels of service triage. Um, I called it Delta is ready when you are because it looked like the, uh, an, out, an airport counter to me. Um, the, um, they, they created a lot of segment, segmented spaces at Liberty uh, that have a lot of doors to it and that did cause a problem. So that's something to consider. But they also made a point to get as much natural daylight throughout the building as possible. So, um, uh, you know, kind of lesson learned. And I think that's why on the renderings, which there'll be a couple of shots at the end, you saw a lot of glass on the tower. That was why, is the whole, whole idea was to get that natural daylight into the building as much as possible. So the purposeful assessment of space is important because you wanna connect what you're, what you're gonna do with the, 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 the purpose of the gatherings, what kind of services you're providing, how we as a library are partners in the learning and academic mission of the campus. Um, you wanna, uh, as, as, you're, as we're selecting um, assessment methods, you know, it's important to consider what we're expecting to get out of it. That includes, you know, what kind of questions are we asking? What kind of data are we uh, uh, gathering? And uh, what's gonna be the best strategy for reporting results and making decisions? So you've done all that, okay? Uh, or I'll say we will do all of that to get all this information pulled together. And then the next piece of this is gonna be starting a design. So there'll be initial concepts that'll be put together. Uh, and then they will present that. Uh, they'll present that out for feedback. Uh, it might come in the form of a focus group. It might come in the form of putting out some drawings and having a place to write comments, that kind of stuff. But they, they don't just design it and off we go. They want feedback to tweak as we go forward. Now, in our case, we're remaining open during the renovation. So it's important that the sequencing piece is also kind of layered into that so we know what to expect. In other words, what part of the building are they gonna work on when and how we're gonna stage what's there now uh, or rearrange and that kind of stuff. So this is where you start developing what the logistical needs are gonna be uh, in terms of um, uh, moving things, uh, storing things, um, manpower, stuff like that. So you, you start at the design level, connecting that to the logistical needs going forward. Uh, there is an oversight committee that's been formed. And in, in this case, in our case, it's, it's, it's got campus representation. We have that list. Uh, Tim's already put that list into our, uh, our, our renovation update link off the main page. Um, it helps coordinate the role of others when you have this group together. And this, this group is going to help keep stakeholders informed. 
So, um, and sometimes it's going to be things that people don't want to hear. Uh, you know, we've already had issues, you know, with people thinking that we're going to deselect stuff that they don't want us to. And uh, I, I think that's jumping the gun because we don't know yet. We really don't know yet. But this group helps make collective decisions. So it's not us, the library, saying we're going to do this, that, and the other without some kind of vetting process. Uh, that communication piece is going to be critical, I think, for the campus because this campus has a lot of different desires and needs. Uh, and so it's, it's important that we approach this collaboratively as a group. Um, the, this committee will also solicit feedback, um, you know, to get ideas and, and um, um, uh, things along the way that will be helpful in, in, in finishing up the design and moving it into construction. Uh, and this group will also be the ones asking questions as needed to kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, push back if needed, you know, why are we doing this? Is it really needed? That kind of thing. So then you go into document design. <clears throat> Hang on a minute, swallow. So this is where the designers <clears throat> have taken all of the um, information that's been gathered through the assessment, through the um, uh, reports, through the, the feedback, uh, through the tweaks. And this is where they start laying out what the design's going to look like. And uh, they'll go through its own version of tweaking. Um, you know, and, and there's going to be some prioritization based on money. <clears throat> but once that design document is developed and everybody is um, in agreement that this is the best we can do, uh, then that will go through a series of approvals by different people uh, to sign off on it. And what happens next is that design document um, is going to turn into construction documents. Now, I, I said I'd mentioned that construction manager at risk. The purpose of having this role early on is to keep the project on budget. They did this with the nursing building, and the nursing building came in on budget. And the point is, you have the construction company present in the form of a manager uh, that's present. Uh, and if a designer is coming up with something, well, let's do this uh, awning in a gold-plated uh, something or other, the construction manager is say, hey, that's not in the budget. That's going to cost you money. In other words, they're tying the practicality of certain elements in design to a cost. And so that's, that's the point of having them on early. And that way, when we do get to construction documents, which is next, that's, that's those design documents become construction documents, uh, everybody is comfortable that they're realistic and that they're gonna fit the mold of uh, what's expected. So uh, with the construction documents, this is where the, yes, we're starting to communicate now the process. In our case, it's gonna be the sequencing, the staging, what's gonna be first, uh, what needs to move, uh, what kind of entrances are we gonna close first, what kind of traffic patterns are we expecting? All of that kind of stuff is what you start doing with the construction documents. Uh, and it becomes a very uh, uh, strong logistical uh, piece. And then the last one is finishing up. So once you finish up the renovation, there's always going to be a punch list. And that's something that gets forgotten sometimes. Every project that we have done, uh, have, we've had a punch list for. So there'll be a punch list, which means in a project this size, it's probably going to be another year before all the little nooks and crannies and bits and pieces are completed. And I, and I think it's important to know that up front so that when we say, hey, we're done, we're really not done. And, 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 and so you understand that there's uh, always going to be something left to do and fix. Um, the uh, construction pathways uh, then can have a kind of a celebration component to it. Um, it's, it also, you've made some changes potentially to what people are, are used to. So that's where the uh, communication with the, uh, the end result is important. Um, but uh, the celebration is, is going to be uh, the big deal because uh, there's going to be a lot of work to get there. So that's kind of it in a nutshell in terms of what we're going to experience over the next five years. Uh, the rest of this PowerPoint, and I'll, I'll just kind of uh, go through it quickly, uh, there are resources out there. So there is a LibGuide that ACRL has. So I was, I was directing this uh, over. 
Uh, and then I've kind of talked about our path as we went through this. But uh, these are some of the things that we're going to have to consider as we go forward. Uh, we've already you know, started having discussions about uh, print books and, 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 and people uh, um, being alarmed uh, about it, but we need to make sure that they're not alarmed about it, that uh, there's, a, there's a, a proper answer for all of it. Uh, what kind of service points are we going to need and how we're going to staff them? Uh, what types of user spaces uh, are we going to look for? We saw a variety of study rooms in those site visits uh, from small to large. Uh, so those kind of things are, are what we're going to be looking at. Uh, where will staff be located and, and, um, uh, and or modified in their uh, ex existing uh, spaces? And uh, what other functions or units should be invited into the library? So that's kind of what's happening right now with DAX. We're working on uh, how that space is probably going to transition into an academic achievement center. And we will talk more about that at the next all personnel meeting because we're still working on, on those components. But um, uh, those are the kind of things that we're going to be looking at specifically uh, here. Uh, we need to recognize that user needs have changed. And so, uh, Part of that goes back to the communication of uh, materials. You know, the, the tower, the tower that was built in the mid 70s, that was a common uh, activity on academic libraries across the country because that was before computers and databases and stuff like that. So it's all about uh, collecting print material. So that's what the tower was meant to be, a warehouse of material. And uh, so it's, it's it's important that we recognize that there's that change in how that works. Um, these collections are built to support the academic mission, uh, and, and historically they're kept. You know, materials kept historically for research purposes. So um, we are making uh, every effort to make sure that no information is lost, that any research that needs to be done from a historic nature is still going to be available somewhere. Um, and the uh, user needs have changed in terms of what users are looking for. So I think that's important to keep in mind too, because uh, we've talked about a, very, a variety of different things, group spaces, individual study spaces, stuff like that. So there'll be a lot of conversations related to that. Uh, part of the assessment is gonna be to talk to students about what they want, you know, and, and not just what they want, but how, what they're gonna use. It's, it's easy to give a wish list uh, to Santa Claus, but you don't always get what um, what you asked Santa for because Santa determined you didn't really need it. So we're going to have probably some of that as we go forward, uh, trying to, 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 to tap down the expectations and line that up with the affordability. Um, there, we saw a lot of reoccurring themes on those uh, site visits, which might come into play here. Um, uh, book bots, central storage, remote storage, that kind of stuff. We saw different versions of that. Uh, we saw a variety of study rooms that I mentioned. Uh, we looked at stats and asked about stats in different places. Uh, we looked at how they centralized uh, um, service points and the use of stadium risers like those staircases. Uh, we looked at uh, information displays, uh, Four Winds is a company, uh, but we've already started doing our own version of that. Eric's been uh, uh, putting up these uh, um, uh, on our, our monitors, um, a lot of good information. And so we might already be there for that. And we can use those to help direct people during the renovation. Um, we saw a lot of uh, signage. Uh, and, and policies which changed kind of from place to place in the different types of um, spaces that we saw. Uh, we saw a variety of different food options um, uh, in those things. Um, some of the other uh, just general notes, um, you can kind of read through that. Uh, I mentioned natural lighting is, is popular. I mean, these are some of the things that we are probably going to be looking at. Um, you know, having um, uh, lockers, uh, uh, having mobility, different colors, um, uh, recycling, and, and there is a recycling component to construction, just so you know. Uh, I mentioned that graduate uh, faculty space. Uh, and then um, there, there's been talk about uh, bringing, you know, we do SOAR 
um, uh, in June when new students are coming in. But in the spring, uh, there's a lot of campus recruitment where fam families are coming in looking at UNCG. And I can see the library becoming a, uh, uh, a gathering place for families coming in and, and, and seeing nice new pretty uh, library spaces as an incentive to come to this campus. Uh, library space is limited, and so that's going to be the messaging. You know, we've got to make decisions based on uh, what's going on there. Um, you know, in my presentation, this was more generic because it, everybody's situation is different. Um, like, for example, um, if you're familiar with the, the Atkins Library at Charlotte, uh, they uh, have, are leasing a remote storage space. They cleared out a lot of things that we had already cleared out and moved to Ferguson. What they'll do long term, it's hard to say because it is a lease, but uh, that's what academic libraries are doing right now is having to make these kind of decisions. Uh, we want to keep in mind the whole learning attributes and the importance of that uh, with the um, um, uh, with the renovation because we are uh, in a learning environment and we want to have the attributes that's going to be um, uh, appropriate for that. Uh, these, this was just some notes about stakeholder experiences. Um, from my retail background, I can just tell you that what's, what's uh, interesting is that uh, drama. Uh, I had the, the CEO of Barnes & Noble come through my store in Atlanta once, and he talked about um, Barnes & Noble is built on the concept of creating drama for the customer. And um, so that's, that's kind of what this was meant to be. The service values that are presented should match what you've done. If you've invested a lot of money into a renovation or expansion like that, <clears throat> you wanna make sure that you're, you're supporting that with uh, high service standards. So an example of that, uh, addressing uh, the accessibility issues and something just so you guys know, in every conversation I've had with uh, designers and stuff like that, we are talking about the handicap access in the back and how that needs to change. <clears throat> and everybody's agreeing. So I'm expecting <clears throat> that to change for sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you guys know this, this was just showing the group. Uh, this was demonstrating our center of campus uh, uh, situation. Um, then I had some slides just uh, talking through uh, different scenarios. In this case, that's uh, the third floor instead of the main building that's been renovated uh, with sprinklers as a closed stack environment. And then the uh, staff uh, offices on the left. You guys know that. Uh, this is that uh, restroom that I mentioned um, where the men's room had to be added for uh, code. And of course, the women's room was um, uh, updated at the same time as well. Um, this is a concept map. So this is where, uh, the, with the use of colors, you're kind of conceptualizing where different uh, things are going to go. And that way, at a glance, you can look uh, and, and say on you know, any given color, like in this case, I think orange was meant to represent staff offices. So you can look at this floor and just kind of in an instance say, oh, okay, orange is staff offices. That's roughly... Uh, what, 15 or 20% of the space on the floor. And that's how a lot of the architects will view things like that. Uh, that's a typical tower floor, if you haven't seen this before. And you can almost see the fact that uh, we're not ADA compliant, just, just the way these, this is set up. That's expected to change. Uh, in the master plan, they actually turn the bookcases uh, the other way so that um, um, the natural light comes on either side, on the ends, but they also have to reduce, and that, that's where the, um, some of the reduction of um, book shelving ability is, is coming into play. And we, that's, that's something we'll be addressing. Um, we never did this, but this was an example of just how this computer lab refresh was gonna take place. Um, and I just, I talked about it in the, um, in the presentation as an example of um, um, uh, 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 using this space in a variety of different ways. Another example of the um, concept of uh, um, uh, design. So you can see this goes back to when we were putting in the digital media commons, uh, what's that been 11 years ago? 
And then the same example, I use, I use that example to talk in terms of when we were putting together the digital media commons, um, we did go out and look at other places, like in this case, this was the Knoll Studio in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and this was uh, the Lego Info Commons at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, looked at emerging trends coming out of Seattle and uh, uh, the Stokey Public Library. We do learn things from the public library uh, world. And I think having a LAS department uh, here in place, they're gonna be a great partner in, in, in walking through some of this. Just another example of some of the master planning um, concepts uh, in, in developing cost analysis. Uh, you've probably seen these before too. Um, we had a list of uh, motivators, uh, which were drivers. In other words, why, this is back to the why, we need to, to uh, update our spaces. And this uh, turned into some of the vision and goals that we were expecting to have. And I have these posters in my office if you want a better look at them. And I think I mentioned before, this PowerPoint is already in my NC docs if you want to look at it. Uh, these are some of the concept designs that were put together for the master space planning. And that's what I was saying before. They will start by taking this and determining what we can still afford and move forward with. So um, I don't share these much anymore just because I know they're going to change. And that, like I said, we use that for cost projections. Um, this is something that I think will stay. It's going to be the west entrance into the traffic circle. It might not look exactly like this, but I think there's still going to be that desire to make that happen. And that goes back to that whole crossroads idea so that you can walk from the traffic circle through the building to College Avenue. And then the same thing coming through the EUC, uh, potentially out the other side over to the dining hall. Um, open spaces is a trend. So I, I, I think we can expect to see some of this at least suggested. Uh, and then this will give us an opportunity to brand. Um, brand things better. So uh, this was just a way to kind of show how branding inside the building can be significant. And then outside the building, um, I don't think we're going to see all that glass, just to be honest with you. Uh, but I think we'll see some because I think that desire to get some natural light into the building is going to be there. So uh, this is how I concluded the presentation. Uh, just talking about how important the library space is going to be for working, for socializing, to, uh, in our case, to inspire and, and lend itself to creativity, uh, a place to convene for collective works, meaning bringing people together to, to do common uh, activity, uh, a place to find information and to help self-educate. Uh, the traditional um, um, a de definition of a learning commons, and I haven't used that word yet, but it was to have the resources in the same place as the technology and in the same place uh, of, of the knowledge, meaning the librarians and staff who would help people with it. And so um, I think they don't use that, the term's not used as much anymore because it's almost a given that uh, that's what you're trying to do. So what we're looking at is hopefully we can architecturally enhance to, to create some inspiring space. Uh, it's important to keep it clean and in good shape, you know, for the to, for, because this will be the last renovation we'll we'll get in our lifetime, I think. Um, and then um, in just engaging that development of atmospheric conditionings to to help create some excitement and drama. And this is on top of all the safety issues. Like I said, that's going to be the priority is our health and safety issues. Last couple of slides was my commercial for the Journal of Learning Spaces. And um, uh, I'm always open and needing um, the um, uh, peer reviewers or copy editors. So if you're interested, please let me know. As I use it as a, as a recruitment tool. And that was the last slide. So that's how I, I wrapped up. So um, hope that didn't take too long, but if there's any questions, we'll try to squeeze them in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mike. And you're getting some uh, some Zoom applause. Um, 
we didn't have any questions during the session. I did put up the link to the Journal of Learning Spaces and the link to your slides from NC Docs. And Terry mentioned, I guess Terry's been to the Atkins Library, mentioned that the new furniture and layout looks excellent. Okay, um, good. Yeah, and I'll just tell you guys, and I, I've said this before, but uh, we're going to keep our monthly all personnel meetings. And the point is going to be to keep this whole process as transparent as possible. So the opportunity here was to give you the big picture of what, what's ahead. But the details as we go forward will be updated, um, you know, at all these, these given points as things happen. Like today, mentioning that we did get uh, approval for our contract uh, manager at risk. And then there'll be a kickoff meeting probably at the beginning of August. And of course, we'll bring that information and present that as well. So that's that's going to be the goal is to keep keep this transparent and communicating out to uh, you guys and the other stakeholders as we go forward. And Sean asks, what is the chance we could get a coffee shop a la Wake Forest Library? Well, I, I kinda, I'm going to say it's going to be based on the assessment, you know, typically pretty good. I mean, that's a trend is to put coffee shops in the library. We have tried to do that before and uh, we don't have the infrastructure in place for it. But if we're going to change the infrastructure, then, and then it might change into a way to uh, to make that happen. And there's some interest in specifically having an outpost of Tate Street Coffee House here in the library. So. You know what, um, Michelle, that actually came up. Um, so back, this goes back, I don't know, 10 years or so. Um, Dave Perrin was the provost and um, he got mad having to wait in line over at uh, the Barnes and Noble. So he came in over here and told Roseanne to get a coffee shop in here. So I spent a lot of time back then uh, trying to figure something out. And I was working with Scott Millman, who's still around. He's a vice chancellor for business enterprises. And he brought in several options, including I think Tate Street. Uh, and they just, none of them worked. Um, but like I said, we didn't have the right infrastructure in place. Um, yeah, Weatherspoon has got their little outpost piece. And that was something we had looked at too. Uh, there's some problems with that in the sense that we don't have the uh, like clean sinks and things like that close by to make it efficient. So it um, uh, it would it would always be kind of somewhat problematic. But I I would say I'd, I'd put money on the fact that we'll probably get a coffee shop one way or the other. All right. Any other questions for Mike while we are here? I'll say we we had a coffee shop in the library when I worked at Kansas State, um, and it was definitely not shorter lines than the <laughs> coffee shop in the student center. Um, well, I just it, remember the, the story from. Uh, yeah, that's that's funny. I'm sure. I'm, I mean, I'm sure it would it would help probably, especially in our case, since they're so close together. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But now you guys, uh, hopefully this helped you kind of have a feeling for what's happening. So please feel free as we go forward to uh, ask questions as we as we update you at each step of the way. You know, and if you want to have a conversation about it, let me know. All right. Thanks, everyone, and thank you especially to Mike for this presentation. This will be posted on our YouTube channel for the libraries and will be in on the ULVLC uh, guide with all the other archived videos. So thanks so much, everyone, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Yep. Stay dry. Bye. Bye.